very much hope that you can all hear me. Um, and sadly, this is not Athens. I'm not in Athens, as many of you can probably realize this is a uh, 3D virtual reality laser scan uh, of the Acropolis and the Parthenon taken by uh, from a drone a couple of years ago for one of the programs we did, which is at least giving us a sense of the travel that we could all hope for uh, or have hoped for this summer um, out to Greece um, and sets the scene for what we're going to be talking about today, which is, of course, um, the Battle of Salamis and its impact. Now, um, a little bit of nerdy uh, date stuff first. Um, in, if you were in Greece, uh, you were encouraged to celebrate the 2500th anniversary of the Battle of Salamis, 480 BC to 2020, last year, because uh, the Greeks wanted to keep 2021 free and clear to celebrate another really important date for them, which was, of course, 1821, 200 years ago, where, which was the Greek War of Independence and the beginning of the story of modern Greece. But of course, as I'm sure you're all acutely aware, dates don't work that clearly and easily um, because, of course, there was no uh, naught uh, BC. And so actually, if we wanted to be deadly correct, nerdily correct, the 2500th anniversary of the Battle of Salamis is actually this year, 2021. So we can celebrate Battle of Salamis this year, even if the Greek government told us we should have done it last year. Um, I want to share uh, a PowerPoint with you uh, now, and uh, we're going to crack on with thinking about uh, the Battle of Salamis and its impact. I'm particularly interested um, in this talk on the impact uh, on Athens, um, uh, and indeed then more widely in terms of how Athens relates to its Greek neighbours and eventually how Persia will respond to that. Um, but I want to go in uh, through most of the talk in quite some detail looking at how Athens responds, because it's really how Athens responds to Salamis, I think, that sets up, starts the snowball rolling down the hill for how the rest of Greece ends up responding and thus how Persia ends up responding. So just to set some scene for those of you uh, kind of less familiar with the run up to the Battle of Salamis in 480 BCE, this is a nice pretty looking watercolour of um, ancient Athens with, of course, the Acropolis and the Parthenon at the centre. Let's remember, it's not a massive place. At its height, 50,000 male adult citizens. When you add in wives, children, uh, and slave populations, probably looking at something around 200 to 300,000, um, but it is a fairly small town. Um, and Athens, as we come up to 480, has actually been celebrating, of course, um, a quite a few amazing recent achievements. Now, the first off is actually the invention and establishment of democracy as its new political system of government. Um, we are only about 28 years on from the establishment of democracy in 480. Democracy, the political system of Athens, is a baby. Um, it's not yet reached uh, teenagehood. In fact, they're probably not even at this stage calling it democracy as a system. That word hasn't yet come into uh, use. That won't happen until about the 460s BCE. Um, but they have started to celebrate this new system. Uh, and in particular, they've done that on the Acropolis. Um, and they've done that in the form of a temple. So you can see here that we know archaeologically, very soon after the establishment of democracy, there is a new temple to Athena Polias set up on the, on the Acropolis, constructed over, we think, the remains of a temple that had been set up by the previous tyrannical regime in charge of Athens. So they've been commemorating democracy, their new found political system. But they've also, by 480, been commemorating their other very recent victory on the battlefield, which is, of course, the uh, victory, at uh, victory at Marathon in 490 BCE, so a decade before Salamis in 480, which was, of course, against the Persians. Um, and again, they focused on the Acropolis as the place to really celebrate this victory, just like they did with the establishment of their new democratic system. And I think we could need to take a moment to just understand quite how massive a celebration through the construction of new architecture and landscape they had intended to make their celebrations for Marathon. 
the first thing they did was in fact extend the Acropolis itself. We can get a sense of that. If you look on this map here, or one on the left, you'll see the temple on the left is the Temple of Athena Polias set up soon after the establishment of democracy. And the temple on the right is the one they start building to commemorate Marathon. Now you're thinking, hang on, that's where the Parthenon goes. Is that the Parthenon? No, it's not the Parthenon. It's a temple they started before they started building the Parthenon, but in exactly the same place. So after 490, the Athenians start to build a, a temple as big as the Parthenon will be in the spot where the Parthenon will be. But to do that, they actually have to first extend the entire landscape of the Acropolis. This is a cross-section of the Acropolis itself, and geologists amongst you will get quite excited about this because it shows you what the Acropolis is actually made of. At the bottom there's a layer of Athenian schist, which is a sort of quite a soft stone, and then it moves into the blue, which is the hard limestone. This is why the Acropolis still stands up tall compared to the rest of the landscape around it. It's this hard limestone sitting on top of the softer schist material. But then you'll notice in yellow on either side, fill. And then you'll notice underneath where it's, writ it's written Parthenon, brickwork. Because what the Athenians had to do in order to create a flat level landscape on which to have enough space to build a temple as big as the Parthenon, or indeed in this case in 490, as big as the temple they're building post the celebrations of Marathon, they have to actually extend the side of the Acropolis, first in brickwork and then with fill against that and then with the outer retaining walls around the Acropolis. They literally remake the landscape of the Acropolis in order to fit in space for their brand new temple. So by the time we get to 480, the Battle of Salamis, this temple is as this map shows, this diagram shows on the left, half built. So we have to imagine the Acropolis as pretty much a building site in 480. And here's a nice kind of uh, imaginative reconstruction of what the Acropolis might well have looked like as they're halfway through building this great temple to celebrate their victory at Marathon. And then surrounding this building site of new temples is a forest of sculptures um, that have been set up by individuals, rich individuals within the Athenian landscape over the last 200 years in celebration of the gods. Okay, so that kind of gets us to 480 in Salamis. Celebration of democracy, celebration of victory over the Persians at Marathon, incurring a massive remaking of the landscape, all focused on the Acropolis itself. And then, of course, Salamis hits, or rather, the second Persian invasion hits, and the Persian army and the Persian navy are sweeping down through Greece. They've overtaken the Spartan 300s, Gerard Butler in his leather nappy uh, at Thermopylae. They're moving down towards the main uh, landscape of Attica and indeed Athens. And this is a copy of an inscription that we know was uh, uh, set up. Um, well, it's a, it's a copy of the decision taken by the Athenian Democratic Assembly to vacate, evacuate from the city of Athens and entrust it to the gods. And it goes like this. Gods, resolved by the boule and the people. Themistocles, son of Neocles, a pharaoh, made the motion. The city shall be entrusted to Athena and to the other gods, all of them, for protection and defence against the barbarian on behalf of the country. The Athenians who live in Athens shall place their children and their women in Troison. The elderly and the movable property shall be deposited at Salamis. The treasurers and the priestesses are to remain on the Acropolis and guard the possessions of the gods. The rest of the Athenians in their entirety and those foreigners who have reached manhood shall embark on the ready to 200 ships and they shall repulse the barbarian for the sake of liberty, both their own and that of the other Hellenes, the Greeks, in common with the Lacedaemonians, Corinthians, Aegeanetans and the others who wish to have a share in the danger. So this is supposedly the decision they make and the decree, this is the written version of it that was set up some centuries later, goes on to say, starting tomorrow, right, we're getting out of here. This is the kind of rush evacuation that the Athenians have to go through. Now, where are they talking about? Um, Athens, you can see in the center of the map, Salamis is the island over to the left, and that's where they will be sending um, movable property and the elderly. Troizen is much further away from the battlefield. And they go on, of course, as you will have been learning, to uh, draw up 
the Greek fleet uh, in the narrow straits between the island of Salamis on the left of this picture and the mainland of Athens uh, on the right of the picture, hoping to draw in the Persian fleet into that narrow strait, whereby their inferior Greek numbers can actually stand a chance against the vastly uh, in, uh, larger, much larger Persian fleet. Now, you know the story of this battle. It's a victory, of course, for Athens um, and those others that are with them. Now, on Salamis, there's almost nothing to see. Uh, if you go to Salamis today, um, as we did a couple of years ago for filming project, um, this is the bay where we think that the Athenian Navy sort of uh, beached up their triremes before going out to face the Persians. There's absolutely nothing there. You can just about, if you look over again through a drone footage, see the remains in the water highlighted here of an ancient sort of harbour wall, which we think we've just discovered in the last couple of years, but there really is nothing else to see. Actually, there wasn't much to see in Athens either, because the Persians invaded the city, despite the fact that they were repulsed at the Battle of Salamis, they had time to invade the city, and they absolutely destroyed it. Again, we're told by Herodotus here that when the Athenians saw that they, the Persians, had ascended to the Acropolis, some threw themselves off the wall and were killed, and others fled into the chamber of the temple. The Persians who had come up first turned to the gates, opened them and murdered the suppliants. When they had leveled everything, they plundered the sacred precinct and set fire to the entire Acropolis. Now, we might be thinking that Herodotus may be overdoing it a little bit and perhaps going over the top as to what the Persians did. But actually, when archaeologists investigated the Acropolis and dug down through the layers of debris to analyze the different phases of the, uh, of the history of the Acropolis, they did find real evidence for, at this specific time period, um, really quite dramatic destruction. So there was evidence for demolished citadel walls, so the, the walls around the edge of the Acropolis, uh, evidence for burned shrines and temples, smashed vases and terracotta dedications, reliefs and inscriptions and statues that had been pushed over, mutilated and then left there. Um, we hear about, and there's evidence elsewhere for the carting off of anything that was in precious bronze that could be melted down or displayed as a trophy. Um, and most definitely, we could think of that forest of sculptures, statues that was up on the Acropolis, pulled down and smashed. That includes, that list includes the destruction of the two temples we were talking about previously on the Acropolis, both the Temple of Athena Polias, set up to celebrate the advent of democracy, and the half-built temple to celebrate Marathon, which was in the position that the later Parthenon would be built. So the Persians really do seem to have destroyed pretty much everything in Athens. And so despite them, the Athenians having a military victory over Persia, and the following year, on uh, land at the Battle of Plataea, and following that, the retrenchment and retreat of the Persian uh, forces back out of Greece. When the Athenians came back to their city, they found it pretty much, we think, destroyed. So the question was, what to do? How do you think the Athenians this time were going to respond? In previous occasions, the establishment of their democracy, victory at Marathon, they had built bigger and better than ever before on the Acropolis as their real focus. What were they going to do this time after another stonking military victory? Well, before we answer that question about what the Athenians did, let's have a look at what other Greek city-states did trying to celebrate their role at particularly Salamis. And this is quite a difficult one because Herodotus will later tell us that really, actually, this was an Athenian victory. This is what he says in Book 7. I find myself compelled to express an opinion which I know most people will object to. Nevertheless, as I believe it to be true, I will not suppress it. If the Athenians, uh, through fear of the approaching danger, had abandoned their country, or if they had stray, stayed there and given in to Xerxes, there would have been no attempt to resist the Persians by sea. I cannot myself see what possible, sorry, possible use there could have been in defending the Isthmus if the Persians had command of the sea. In view of this, therefore, one is surely right in saying that Greece was saved by the Athenians. Next to the gods, it was the Athenians who drove back the Persian king. So if it was so much an Athenian victory, right, 
what did the other Greek city-states do? And we can turn to a place like Delphi, which many of you will recognize here, and look particularly in the area the blue arrow is pointing to, which is the area just in front of the temple, on the temple terrace. And if we focus in on a cute little uh, scale model that's been done of it, we're looking at that figure, again, the arrow is pointing to. This monument was set up directly after Salamis, and it's a bronze statue of Apollo, supposedly once upon a time holding a ship, uh, over just under six metres high, a massive, massive, massive statue. Now, who put this up? Well, we don't have the bronze statue surviving any anymore, but we do have the block that it was standing on. And this is what it looks like in the drawing. And you can see on the top stone, it has writing on it. Now, rather annoyingly, or rather magically and mystically, we have all of the inscription apart from the first word. And that's really annoying because the first word is the name of the dedicator who put it up. And I've put in the Greek down below all the different letters that are surviving. And because the inscription lines, the two lines match up exactly, we know we are looking for a first word, which is eight letters long. Now, many people think that it should be this, Helenes, the Greeks. So the Greeks huh, dedicate this to Apollo. It's the first line. Second line, it's the name of the sculptor, the guy who did it. Theopropos made this, and he was from Egina. The Greeks set this up as a communal monument to their victory. But was it kind of, and is this how we should restore this inscription? I'll leave you to ponder that. But we know that at Delphi, other individual city-states did then put up additional monuments to claim their own role at Salamis, despite the fact that this was an Athenian victory. So people you would never have heard of and very, do very, very little in the, in, the, in the story of Greek history. The Paparethians, the Epidorians, the Aegeanetans, everyone seemed to be getting in on the act at Delphi, putting up monuments to celebrating Salamis. But the Athenians did not put up a single monument to their role in this great victory at Salamis, at Delphi at least. What did they do back in Athens? Well, some things did seem to have survived the Persian destruction because we know they were seen later on and stories were told about the fact that they had survived. Right? Um, things like, crucially, the cult statue of Athena that stood within the temple of Athena Polyas, the most sacred statue that the Athenians had. But on the other hand, think about this as a choice of response. The Athenians undertook no monumental building on the Acropolis in the period 480 to 450 BCE. That's confirmed archaeologically. So whereas previously they had built bigger and better than ever before in celebration of their democracy and in the celebration of Marathon, now post Salamis, they made the decision to build nothing, not at Delphi and not even on their precious Acropolis at the center of their city. Now we're told by Diodorus much later that there may be a reason for this, that they'd actually taken an oath to not rebuild the temples that the Persians had destroyed, but to leave them as a monument for men hereafter, a memorial of the impiety of the barbarians. Imagine if your home city was destroyed and when you made it back to live in your city again, you chose to leave the center of it, a blackened, ashened, unbuilt heap of rubble as a permanent reminder of what had been done to you. It was a very bold and very novel decision. But they did do some things, we know, and again, it's the archaeology that lets us in on here at this. We think they cleaned up a bit on the Acropolis because the way the material is left for us to excavate shows that it was all swept up and neatly kind of buried and forced into the ground on the Acropolis to make it at least walkable, and manageable and usable as a space. At the same time, they did build something new on the Acropolis, defensive fortification walls around most of the sides. There are no temples on the Acropolis, but it certainly had fortification walls. And we think that they started to put up new statue dedications. And over the next couple of decades, that would include one of the largest sculptures that had ever been created, the Athena Promachos statue. And we'll have a look at a picture of that in a second. And then a few other potential small structures, but certainly nothing major. Let's have a look at those fortification walls. This is another one of those drone uh, laser scans. And what you need to look at is the wall directly facing you. You can start to see some round column drums, hopefully just in the middle section of it. If you go in to a real life picture, here they are. And 
On the left top picture, you can see column drums in the wall. And for the, the bottom right picture, hopefully, you can identify some triglyphs and metopes that should really be up on the top of a temple, not in a fortification wall. These are all bits of that temple that they had started to build in celebration of Marathon that they actually now used in the fortification walls of the Acropolis. And here's our, on the left, Athena Promachos statue. This was a 30 foot statue and seems to have been made um, from spoils taken from the Persians in the, both the Battle of Marathon and the Battle of Plataea. And it points, it looks directly towards Salamis. So here perhaps we're getting our first sense of how the Athenians chose to celebrate Salamis. This enormous sculpture of Athena, their patron deity, looking out over the whole of Athens and looking directly towards Salamis itself. And you get a sense here in the much, much later Acropolis of how big and how tall this statue was. You can see it there towering above everything. Now, I think this decision to not build on the Acropolis and not invest in religious structures like new temples is even more surprising and even more interesting when we look at what they did build in other parts of the city of Athens directly following the Battle of Salamis. They start to build a lot. It's places like the Academy, one of the philosophy schools of Athens is monumentalized and given proper facilities in this period. It's places like the Agora, the marketplace and the political center of day-to-day decision-making that gets a whole raft of new buildings that you can see there listed. So they're not building on the Acropolis, but they are building buildings necessary for both their philosophical discussion and thought and their political deliberation very much, very quickly after the Battle of Salamis. They're also building walls. Now we've seen the walls they've built around the Acropolis, but they didn't stop there. The one other major building project the Athenians went in for post Salamis was building city walls to defend themselves against further attack. Now attack from whom, you might ask, given the Persians were in retreat, they'd gone home. Actually, these city walls were, we're told by the Athenian writer Thucydides, really meant to defend the Athenians against other Greek city states. And this is how he puts it. They, the Spartans, would have themselves preferred to see neither her, Athens, nor any other city in possession of a wall. Though here they acted principally at the instigation of their allies, who were alarmed at the strength of Athens, his newly acquired navy, and the valor which she had displayed in the war with the Medes, the Persians. They begged her, Athens, not only to abstain from building walls for herself, but also to join them in throwing down the walls that still held together um, a number of the ultra kind of Peloponnesian cities. So there's a real sense here that all the other Greek city-states don't want Athens to put these walls up, supposedly because they're worried about Athens's power, growing power and might. But Athens is absolutely determined to put these walls up, it seems, because it's worried that it could be taken advantage of and, and uh, another Greek city-state could roll in to try and attack them at any moment. And they build these walls with incredible speed. I don't think we can underestimate quite how much every single Athenian seems to have been dragooned from doing what, stopping whatever else they were doing and being brought in into this massive public entire city building project. Thucydides puts it like this. Meanwhile, the whole population in the city was to labor at the wall. The Athenians, their wives, their children, sparing no edifice, private or public, which might be of any use to the work, but throwing it all down. And to this day, the building shows signs of the haste of its execution. The foundations are laid of stones of all kinds, and in some places not wrought or fitted, but placed just in the order in which they were brought by the different hands. And many columns, too, from tombs and sculptured stones were put in with the rest, for the bounds of the city were extended at every point of the circumference, and so they laid hands on everything without exception in their haste. And it's not just around the city that they're building walls here. They're also doing it, as it says at the bottom, around their port, the port of Piraeus. 
And we can actually get a sense of these city walls. This is a drawing of them, but actually this is the, the kind of the line of the city walls we think that they took going around the city of Athens. And you can still visit some of them today, although you have to go to a car park to do it. Um, and this is where we went uh, kind of in when we were filming a couple of years ago in ancient invisible cities of Athens into an underground car park in modern Athens to catch sight of these. These walls, not these modern concrete white walls with the fire extinguisher on them, but the walls behind them. Those are the th city walls thrown up by the entire population of Athens in haste post Salamis. And this is a not close version of the remainder of them as you can see them today. And this graphic gives you a little bit of a sense of quite how massive a building project this was. The city of Athens on the right hand side surrounded by walls, the port of Piraeus on the left hand side surrounded by walls, and then eventually joined by the long walls on both the north and the south side that effectively isolated Athens and its port from the rest of Greece. Athens was now effectively an island. And this uh, virtual reality and laser scan graphic video, which I hope will work for you now, should give you a good sense of just how massive uh, a project this was. Our scans and graphics show that these walls, concealed within the modern car park, were parts of a series of building projects that would transform Athens. First, the Athenians enclosed their city. Then, almost 10 kilometers away, they fortified the port of Piraeus. And then, they linked the two with a fortified corridor that ran all the way from the port to the center of Athens, a system of long walls, almost 150 meters apart, and estimated to be 3.5 meters high. We don't need to see that again. Oh, there we go. Um, so it kind of hopefully that gives you a sense of what the Athenians did choose to focus on post their great victory at Salamis. Something very, very different than that which they'd focused on both after their victory at Marathon in 490 and a part, a post the development of their democracy in 508. And I think that complete change of emphasis really helps us understand a little bit about what the impact of Salamis was in the Athenian and the wider Greek psyche. Because fundamentally, they chose uh, to turn towards protecting themselves over and above celebrating their victory and honoring the gods, decision that they had never made before. And it wasn't just in terms of wall building, they also start to increasingly strengthen their fleet. Now we can see here some of the detail of that. Now there's two reasons they start to uh, increase their fleet. Obviously, as many of you all know, they sort of take over, the Athenians take over the leadership of the uh, what's now known as the Delian League um, and become the kind of main protagonists in taking the fight supposedly back to Persia. And for that, of course, they need a bigger fleet. But I think the other element of it is very clear that Athens sees the fleet as a key way to protect itself, um, particularly given that the fleet has now protected itself within the walls surrounding um, the Piraeus port of Athens. And there is an inc massive increase, not just in the building of ships, but in the building of ship sheds, places to um, draw the triremes out of the water, fix them, and build them, protect them during the winter months. Um, and you can see here that a recent archaeological investigation called the Zaya uh, Harbour Project um, has uncovered 15 ship sheds just from this era, just in this one tiny harbour. And if we zero in on the Piraeus for a moment, it will help you recognise that there are actually three main harbours in the Piraeus. The one on the top left is the Piraeus port, the modern harbour that you take a ferry from to the islands today. But on the right hand side, you see the port of Zaya, which is where the Zaya Harbour Project has been working, looking at ship sheds, and then the even smaller um, port of Munichia, today called Microlimino which if you're in Athens, I thoroughly suggest is a good place to go for a fantastic fish lunch. So this is what I want to kind of leave you with, a picture of actually the impact of the victory of the Battle of Salamis, 
and then the follow-up Battle of Plataea, which was said to be overwhelmingly and stonkingly an Athenian victory, left a stronger Athens, but an Athens that had decided to focus all of its energies in ensuring its defense against other Greek city-states as much as its future defense and superiority against the Persians. And Athens that had chosen to forfeit in order to protect itself better its normal routine of celebrating victories with honoring the gods through the creation of more temples. And as a result of Athens's actions, and as a result of Athens's a decision to build its city walls, increase its fleet, start throwing its weight around a bit more, what we see is actually a much more divided Greece rather than a united one, as perhaps um, that statue at Delphi dedicated by the Greeks might have suggested. And what we get coming out of that over the next 20 or 30 years is a complete change in Persian policy towards Greece. No longer are they going to bother with actually trying to invade and conquer the country. Instead, they realize that they can much more effectively uh, keep Greece out of their hair by ad adapting and adopting a divide and rule policy of keeping the Greeks fighting themselves and thus out of Persian um, out of keeping them out of Persia. And this actually works, we have to admit, incredibly successfully, because the Greeks won't invade Persia properly for, uh, well, until the early part of the fourth century um, in a very minor incursion. And then, of course, not until very much more well known in the latter part of the fourth century uh, BC with the invasion of Alexander the Great. So, actually, the impacts of Salamis turn out to be, I think, quite surprising. Um, and certainly perhaps not what was intended. And that is where I'm going to leave it to with about 10 minutes for questions. While people are thinking and uh, posting their questions, um, we've had a question sent in in advance um, from Repton School, which is um, asking about whether the Persian Wars more generally, particularly thinking about Salamis and Plataea, had an impact on religious thought in ancient Athens, which I think is a really, really interesting question. So perhaps we can pick up on that um, before we sort of move to other questions that people might have. Um, and I think kind of, I, I guess I would divide this in two ways. Coming out of my talk, I guess the initial uh, reaction would be, yes, there is an impact on religious thought or at least religious action. And that's to turn the Athenians away from commemorating the gods and celebrating the gods and celebrating their own achievements uh, in tune with celebrating the gods, i.e. by building more temples, as they had previously done to both post-democracy and post-marathon, and instead focusing on much more mundane, if you like, secular um, activities such as building defensive walls. Um, but on the other hand, one of the reasons for that uh, decision to not build up on the Acropolis and instead leave the Acropolis as this memorial to the brutality and the barbarian nature of the Persians was because supposedly, according to Diodorus, they'd taken a religious oath um, uh, in order to get the victory in the first place. So one could argue equally that they thought they were doing their duty by the gods, what they owed the gods, leaving the Acropolis bare um, for a period of time after the destruction. But if we think back to Marathon in 490, we see another kind of much more direct religious impact, which is actually the introduction of a kind of new god into the Athenian pantheon. So many of you might be familiar with the story that supposedly at the battlefield of Marathon, the god Pan, uh, who hadn't really hitherto been worshipped very much in Athens. He was a god of the countryside. He was a god of kind of other parts of Greece. And Boeotia, one of Paul's favourite places, kind of kind of has, you know, a, a, is, a, is a big fan. They're big fans of worshipping the god Pan. Athens, not so much. They're a bit too city slick. But actually, supposedly at Marathon, Pan turned up and inspired panic in the Persian forces. And as a result, uh, post the Battle of Marathon, you see the worship of Pan in Athens um, increase dramatically. Now, he doesn't get a temple on the Acropolis. Um, in fact, he, he's worshipped most uh, often in sort of quite rural cave settings, both at the base of the Acropolis and indeed spread out through the countryside of Attica. Um, but so we are, we do see, as a result of particular moments in Persian invasions, the kind of introduction or, 
or embracing of new particular divinities that supposedly helped the Athenians. Um, but post Salamis and Plataea, what we overwhelmingly get is this impression that they're turning away from um, celebrating the gods uh, and thinking instead about self-defense. We've had a question up on the chat from uh, Zaverian College. Um, do you think that Athens was nervous more about Sparta or other naval powers, particularly Egina Corinth, in building the walls? Um, I think it was a mix of all of these things. Um, I think going back to that example at Delphi, whereby Athens doesn't celebrate its victory, but nearly everyone else piles in to do so, gives you a sense of just how um, competitive actually, even in this moment supposedly of Greek unity, when the Greek forces had come together to um, defend collectively in one form or another against the Persian invasion, actually how quickly that sense of unity disintegrates and how quickly it returns to the, the normal sort of competitiveness in the building of monuments um, to say, that, you know, we had a role in this battle that, you know, frankly, they probably didn't even have. Um, and I think that is paralleled and seen in kind of in the, in the wider geopolitics and in the kind of military maneuvers that are happening directly afterwards. I mean, if you get into the, the detail of Thucydides um, over the building of the walls, the Athenians are absolutely cloak and dagger about it. You know, Themistocles, who's overseeing this kind of um, this period, is sort of simultaneously in Sparta saying, no, we're not building walls. We're not building walls. No, 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 no. At the same time as sending messages back to Athens going, build those walls, build those walls as fast as you possibly can. And only when they're built to a sufficient state of actually being useful as defensive walls, does he then go, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, we've we've built the walls. Um, and those walls are simultaneously defending the Piraeus as much as the city of Athens. So they're defending Athens from both um, kind of attack to a certain extent from the sea and from the land and allowing them then to get on with the business of increasing their fleet. And you're absolutely right as a very college that all of those places are threats on the map um, that are uh, that Athens is worried about in this period. And it's one of those um, inevitable, well, as it's become known, isn't it? The Thucydides trap that as Athens decides it needs to get more powerful to defend itself, everyone else gets more worried about Athens and the need to actually then combine together and defend themselves against the increasing power of Athens. And that's why this term, the Thucydides trap, is used so often in modern geopolitics to think about America and China, um, as one sort of each tries to think about defending themselves and thus looks more powerful and thus kind of inevitably the other person thinks they have to armor up as well and thus potentially inevitably leading into conflict. And we know where this story is going. It is going into the open conflict of Greek civil war in the Peloponnesian War. Um, Louise uh, Savage has come in and asked, do we know how the walls were funded? Um, so this is really interesting, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, in terms of uh, kind of, are they actually bringing in uh, professional builders having to pay them? No. I mean, what Thucydides is telling us is that they are literally getting every man, woman and child back in Athens to build the walls. So effectively, it's free citizen labor. Um, and what are they building them with? Everything they could find. I mean, you know, when they excavated the city walls, the bits I showed you in the car park actually look quite good and professional. But you know, there are other bits where literally they do find statues that have been grabbed off tombs and thrown into the rubble foundations for these walls. And effectively, the lower base foundations that have to be bigger, they filled with absolutely everything. And then as they went higher, the walls got to sort of finer build work where potentially they were um, bringing in contractors. Um, so there must have been a cost overall to it uh, and effectively it's coming out of the spoils one should imagine of uh, the, the wars that they've just fought um, and managed to get capture um, from um, particularly the Persians. Uh, Paniota, what was their source of the material that was used? Everything and anything that came to hand. I think that's crucial, particularly for the lower levels of the walls. Um, and after that, they're the resourcing building material from the nearest uh, kind of mountainsides around um, Athens. Brunwood, since they built walls to defend themselves, was there an increase in military propaganda so that more of the Athenians were trained to protect the city? This is a really interesting question. And I think we'd love to know more here about what the... Um, impact is on uh, kind of whether or not um, the kind of required 
kind of training program for young Athenian men was extended or increased. Um, certainly, if they're building more ships, they're going to need more people to row them. And fundamentally, we know that they weren't using slaves to build, uh, to, to row these ships. It was Athenians of all, all um, social levels um, that were being asked to row the ships. And actually, uh, the fact that you could defend your city by rowing ships meant that everyone could equally contribute to the defense of the city and it re-emphasizes that democratic ideology. So I would suspect yes there was then an increase actually in the kind of military propaganda, the request for military service and certainly in terms of rowing the triremes. But a um, quick one from Rebecca Tyreman from Strode's College. When did the Athenians start to rebuild the Acropolis and what prompted the change? Great, great question. And it is that turning point in the 440s when effectively we can no longer talk about the Athenians leading a Delian League and rather we talk about the Athenians running an empire when they move the treasury of the Delian League from the island of Delos in the Aegean to Athens for safekeeping. Um, and at that point in the 440s, we see uh, an absolute explosion of a building program, the Periclean building program, which will include, of course, the Parthenon. And I think it's really interesting to see the way that every part of the Periclean building program on the Acropolis all of the buildings link in with intentionally the previous eras of construction on the Acropolis. So for instance, the Propylia, the great entrance gateway onto the Acropolis, links into the massive Cyclopean walls that have been on the Acropolis since Mycenaean times. Right. Um, the uh, Parthenon is building right on top of the ground and that had been prepared for the post-Marathon Temple and in fact reuses some of that Marathon Temple material in the building of the Parthenon. So the Periclean building program crucially I think brings gets its legitimacy and authority from the fact that it is um, combining past and present so uh, kind of um, conclusively to uh, offer up a new image of uh, a, a kind of a massively powerful and omnipotent Athens.